Here we go. starting on chapter 23, first A provider. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump into it. Before we do, we've got bathrooms in the back. Water fountains also in the back. There's uh, It's raining today, so if the weather gets real bad, our exits are out this door and out that door. And um, I think we should be fine. So if you need to go to the restroom while, I, uh, while I'm teaching, please wait till um, I give you a break. <laughs> um, we'll do breaks every so often, but just let me know. <laughs> Chapter 23, first aid provider. All right, so we're going to go through uh, learning objective one, describe the role of the fire service in pro providing emergency medical care. So as a, um, as a Springfield Fire Department, we have EMTs. And with EMT, we can only do certain things. So we do pretty much the treatment on scene before the ambulance arrives, um, which a lot of it is uh, administering oxygen, which we'll go over as one of our skills, the non-rebreather. We also do a lot of CPR, which we'll go as uh, one of our skills as well, um, do BBM. So, and we help load up and transport the victims to the healthcare facility, um, whether it be Cox or Mercy. Um, most places just have three different types of EMS ambulance services. Uh, we have hospital-based EMS. Um, there's also fire-based EMS. Some of the bigger cities um, have that, like St. Louis. Um, and then their third service EMS, if there's no um, be a third party um, with that. So. so the main thing with us, since we work hand-in-hand -hand with Cox and Mercy, is we want to get familiar with their equipment protocol and standard of care. like. We don't like get in the back and get things, but most of the ambulances are pretty similar to like when we're going, um, riding in the truck with them, doing CPR, helping grab different things. Like we are kind of familiar with where things are, or if on scene we need to get a BBM afterwards, um, we can hop in and get a BBM from them. But uh, the main thing is just so we you want to get familiar with what uh, they have, um, and Cox and um, Mercy are pretty similar with what they carry. Just a few differences, um, but I, it's good to have a good working relationship, which we act like we do here since we see them all the time. Um, so we don't have fully function, functioning paramedics. We do, uh, there's some guys that are medics, but uh, when they're at work at the fire department, they are EMTs and that's their scope of practice. So that's all we do is EMT stuff. We are not allowed to do any paramedics, even if you have a paramedic license. All right, um, Buckner, what role does the fire department play in providing emergency medical care? EMG. That's good. Uh, what level of emergency medical care does the fire department provide in our jurisdiction? EMG. EMG. Yeah. Pretty universal. Yeah. You guys are following right along. I appreciate that. All right, uh, we're going to explain patient confidentiality requirements. This slide really confused Corbin for a long time. Well, there's a lot of words, and I was like, oh, God. Uh, so this is HIPAA, um, and it talks about the different laws that um, are basically put in place to, uh, for patient protection um, of their medical information. It is. Uh, so we are all about for, uh, protecting their privacy. So. We don't ever talk about things. We might talk about things that happen on a call, but we don't ever do names. We don't ever do addresses um, to anyone. Um, so let's keep, it's very important that we, uh, we follow HIPAA's rules and regulations. So a lot of this, be discreet. When you're on a scene, just don't yell out. Um, I, I don't know about you, there's a lot of times you're full up as a fire truck, someone's like, hey, what's going on over there at Missy's house? And we're like, we can't just say, oh yeah, she's having a heart attack, she might not make it. We don't say any information like that. So just be discreet. Um, there's only a few people that really need 
um, the know the information, and we can only do so like if the patient does give us consent. Um, that that'll be different times that they say we can tell so and so like, hey, I'm at Cox or I'm at Mercy. Um, so that's the main thing. So who has the right to access uh, patient medical information? Somebody with a higher level of care that needs to know. Okay, for instance, like a hospital? Like a hospital okay. the, yeah. patient. the patient. The patient would know? No, that's good. Uh, learning objective three, identify communicable diseases that first responders in commonly encounter. All right, patients must uh, may have communicable diseases which are not always obvious. So general rule of thumb with me is I always assume they have something. Um, they need medical attention for something, so it might be for a disease that they don't have. We had a call the other day that the patient had a skin issue and they didn't even know what the issue. They told us it was an unidentified skin issue. So at that point, you um, definitely make sure you have everything covered. Um, and we'll go to a lot of slides of BSI, so body substance isolation procedures. Uh, just making sure we stay away from the fluids and um, of the, the patient. Uh, so we're going to go through a lot of different ones. So hepatitis in general is the inflammation of the liver. Uh, viral hepatitis is the most common and can be caused by drugs, alcohol, hazardous chemicals. Uh, so hep A and hep B we encounter a lot more often and those are here. Typically uh, hep A is uh, caused by consuming contaminated food or water, and then hep B is uh, treatment through body fluids. So hep A can, a lot of people can get if they go to a bad restaurant. Um, there are different um, signs and symptoms with hep A. It's fatigue, abdominal pain, dark urine, fever, um, and they, uh, it's not good for the liver, I'll tell you that much. Hep C is typically transmitted through bodily fluids, um, and you cannot be vaccinated so far uh, with, against hep C and hep D, but you can with hep A. And there you go. Um, so, I mean, just like with everything, just thoroughly wash your hands. If you don't know what they have, I mean, all fire stations have a decon going into, well, at least station 13 has a decon going into the, the place. So we are very big into no matter what, every time after I get off a call, I wash my uh, wash my hand before going into the station. <clears throat> uh, another one is tuberculosis TB. It's a bacterial infection, uh, attacks your respiratory system. Um, prevalent in high density living areas, um, apartments, big cities, high rises, things like that. We don't have a whole lot of that here in Springfield, um, but there are a few places that um, that do have that. And there's different signs and symptoms with tuberculosis. Fever, fatigue, chills, weight loss, painful breathing, um, productive cough. So if someone's been coughing for a very long time, they might have it. So, but we do test to make sure we don't have TB in our system. Um, it's not, we don't see it too often. Uh, definitely, if, since it's uh, people are coughing constantly, uh, definitely use an N95 over just a regular mask uh, or no mask. Um, we don't do an annual skin test, but that's not a bad idea. Uh, HIV and AIDS, um, something that was pretty prevalent um, and very uh, scary, like probably in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it doesn't seem as big of a deal now because we are always using gloves and we're always not, if someone's bleeding, try to get that away from anything that you might have cuts on you. Um, it weakens the immune system to the point where the body is unable to fight the disease. So HIV is a pretty rough one we want to stay away from, but just like in everything, if we don't know that they have anything, just assume they have something. So always wear gloves, eye protection, and masks. Uh, metal equipment and surfaces should be decontaminated de immediately following soiling to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. A lot of this stuff is common sense. Um, and once you get to some of those houses, we, I mean, at our station, we don't even wear our boots into the station. Like we take them off at the, at the truck and don't track that in. So um, I would suggest that you can get your captain on board with that so you don't bring that nasty stuff in from other people's houses into the station. But we also clean our boots if it's a nasty call. But always clean the boxes. Um, they're hard, easy, uh, hard boxes, so they're easy to clean. <coughs> 
the multi-drug resistant organisms, uh, MRSA, uh, that's, that's a tough one to get rid of. So uh, these are ones that could spread and are really uh, hard to get rid of, so it's very important to try to, um, again, wear our gloves, wear everything you can, and uh, always wash your skin. Um, these are different outbreaks that we, I mean, haven't seen really H1N1, um, that type of stuff. Now, COVID has been big since this PowerPoint was put together. And a lot of that was wearing masks, um, staying out of densely populated areas. Um, so and it does change protocols. If you know someone has a certain thing, that might mean a full gown, that might mean definitely wearing an N95. Um, if exposed or possibly exposed, follow SOPs for testing and treatment. Uh, just fill out a report. Um, you don't know what you might get. Um, so if you think that blood or any other fluid touched you where you uh, did not have a glove or a gown on, it's probably a good idea just to fill out an exposure report. Um, and Captain can do it pretty easy and it's just, it just gets on record. Um, I always keep um, an extra shirt on the uh, rig just in case I just need to change my shirt before I even come back to the station. Um, and then I definitely, there have been times that we strip down and change clothes and wash clothes immediately after some of these calls that we go on. Uh, can someone name three communicable diseases that first responders commonly deal with? Hep A, Hep B, Hep C, tuberculosis, A, HIV, I think that's three, you guys. Uh, we're, we're moving right along. Uh, learning objective four is explaining ways to prevent the spread of communicable diseases during emergency care. And we're back. <laughs> Thought we lost them. All right, you may be required to be immunized against certain infectious diseases. Here at the fire station, we uh, got shots early on when we first got hired. Um, <coughs> haven't touched it since. But, I mean, tetanus is a big one that I know you have to get every five, seven, ten years. We'll check our bronze record. Yeah, something about that. Um, I got chicken pox, so apparently you can get immunized and get that now. Mm -hmm. Learned that today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, organisms that carry disease can cause infections. That's not surprising. Um, that's why BSI, keeping our steam safe, and our, sorry, not steam safe, that's something different. Uh, by substance isolation. Uh, it's treatment through contact with infected fluids. Bloodborne pathogen are most common, so, um, but we still have to worry about airborne threats, so that's why masks are very important to have, um, have on. So we're talking about the exposures, uh, if you possibly get exposure. Um, when the body fluid is infected, individuals come in contact with exposed areas. Routes of exposures would be open wounds, cuts, sores, contact through eyes, nose, mouth, um, pretty much any way that the route to get in. So with gloves, that is breaking the chain of contact. So that's one of the ways you can um, help fight against um, exposures. And also hand washing is also important to, uh, here we go. Uh, we can hand wash it, and obviously it's proper PPE. So on gloves, make sure you get gloves that fit you, not too big of gloves that they can slide, fluids can slide underneath. Um, large gloves. Yeah, so Never luckily really. the department doesn't run out of large gloves very often. Um, so sometimes you have to do mediums and they take a long time to get on. Medium, I think. And your sausage hands, you will not be able to. Extra large gloves, it's like wearing your dad's gloves. That is, yeah. But main thing is the hand wash. Uh, and I mean, like I teach my six-year-old, you got the hand washed longer than five seconds. So, um, my personal routine is to get my hands wet, soap, and then go for it again. I, I know a lot of people that just go straight soap and then get them wet. That is so not you true. Want soap dispenser wet. Hundred percent. Then you got new, gross. The soap dispenser. And wet. then sometimes there's the soap. Wash it off. Soap again, and then I will. Uh, wash up to my elbows at times, depending on the type of call we get. Um, and then wash my watch off and everything. So, hand washing is very key. I don't know how many times a day we do this. 
Uh, yeah, I like this guy. Watch wrists, forearms. Um, watch for at least 30 seconds. I uh, use some hand, uh, hand sanitizer when I first get in the rig, and then soap when I get back. So the PPE here, um, you want to use the adequate ones depending on what the disease is. Um, I'd rather go more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I usually, it's a good idea to go over protection than under protection. Um, you hate that when you get on a call and start new CPR and realize they have fluid everywhere and you do not have your goggles. So if you just get into a routine of always having your goggles um, or some sort of glasses and then a mask, it tends to help. Um, so you'll never cut unprepared. Man, they preach this from the opening day. We use gloves all the freaking time. So always wear gloves, um, no matter no matter what. And I don't think I need to teach you guys how to take off gloves. It's pretty easy. You just don't want to contaminate what is clean. So just be careful as you take them off that we don't contaminate uh, contaminate that. And I think it's, I carry extra pair of gloves in my jacket if I'm wearing a jacket. Um, we have an IFAX, extra pair of gloves, in case you need to, one tears or if maybe one gets really soiled and you wanna get a fresh pair on scene, I've done that. Um, and also, there's times I do that to even pick up all of our boxes, medical boxes, trauma boxes, to take back into the truck. Uh, I try not to, if I have very soiled uh, gloves, to continue touching other things. Eye protection is an easy one to forget, uh, but it's easy for um, unnecessary uh, fluids to get in there. Um, so we definitely want to have eye protection. Like I said earlier, um, you don't always realize, you think that, oh, they're not coughing or spitting or whatever, or fluids, but if you have uh, eyeglasses on, it helps keep all that um, away from our eyes. Now there's a combination mask and shield. Uh, we don't use that uh, a whole lot here, um, but we do have them. Uh, not that one, but something similar to that we had during COVID, but they, they don't last very very long, so they're not, not really good. But they are good to use um, if you have them on, on scene. We just don't take good care of things on the fire truck. Uh, masks protect against respiratory hazards, airborne pathogens, and body fluids. Surgical masks uh, are fine for blood or body fl fluids, but like N95s are better, um, a little bit stronger for the different, uh, like we talked about <coughs> tuberculosis earlier. Yeah, N95 uh, respirators. We still carry, um, I think we carry them. I mean, we're supposed to carry them. I don't know if we do much anymore. We got a box. Yeah. And then you have your personal one with your Tupperware. But I, I don't know if anyone Tupperware. carries that I anymore. I keeping track of my Tupperware. That would be yeah, so um, we were fit tested at one point in Blocks 95. And 95s are really good. We just don't do a good job of keeping those on the fire trucks like we yeah. should. They were large gloves and gowns. Um, as, a, as our job, we want to get places quick, and if someone's, um, whether it be like CPR or progress, we don't always feel like we have time for gowns. Um, but gowns are very important. It definitely keeps an extra layer of protection against um, bodily fluids getting onto us. Um, we don't really have to use this much anymore, but we should. I think we probably should do a better job of wearing gowns, but we like to get places fast and don't always um, don't always take the proper care that we need to do. So, spare uniforms, we all have spare uniforms at the station, but like I said, I carry an extra one on the truck with me just in case I need to change. So, uh, we, uh, we talked about this earlier about cleaning our boxes. It's super easy to clean. Uh, we have stuff on the rig to clean it. Um, we have other stuff at the station we can clean it. Uh, we don't have a backboard. Uh, on our engine, but we do on tower two style backboard. Yeah, I'm sure you guys clean that every Saturday. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When they fill up the air tank. Yeah. 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 So, um, but ambulance is definitely do. Um, sure. They do. Yeah, I'm sure they sure they, they uh, clean all their stuff after every call. Uh, 
Um, we have extractors for our gear, for our bunker gear. Um, we don't cross uh, our fire gear with our uh, the washing uh, machines that we use for our clothes. So we're lucky enough to have um, extractors at all stations now. Uh, uh, most of them. Most of Just the important ones. Yeah, sounds good. All the north side stations. Um, and this is contaminated, uh, cleaning and disposal of contaminated items. We don't have any uh, red, I mean, we keep red bags, but we don't really worry about needles and stuff. Um, except on scene, I've helped uh, EMTs and medics clean up their uh, stuff, and they keep it all together really well. Um, so we, as a EMT um, on the fire department, you will have to uh, be able to just recognize that. Um, but we don't have a sharp container. You keep a bio bag in your uh, kit box? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, that's where I was at. You guys have a kit box, don't you? We do. Um, what procedures does the term body substance isolation refer to? Keeping fluid away. That is uh, that's correct. Keep fluids yourself. Uh, body uh, substance isolation is, is key. Uh, what types of PPE do responders typically use during emergency calls? What would you use every time? Gloves. Uh, what do you should you use most of the time? Gloves. Yes. Yes. And crossbows. Yeah. Goggles. Goggles are really rough. The goggles we used to have, and, uh, I mean, you feel like Bill Nye's. Yeah, and right. you can't see, like doing CPR you know, with those helping. things. And, yeah, and, yeah. They and they're like this. Because and if you have glasses already, through. putting that on top, like they yeah, fog up really and it's, it's miserable. All right, learning objective five explain the process of patient assessment. Um, so this is a pretty um, self explanatory. If someone's responding to us, if you ask them, hey, sir, how are you doing? They say, uh, you know, I have chest pains. Their airway's good because they're talking, they're breathing because they're talking, and their circulation might be, I mean, they're at least circulating. Uh, their blood fine, it, I mean, they might be having some issues. Um, but it's pretty easy. You're not gonna start with circulation, airway, breathing. Um, that's only for unresponsive patients that can't tell you that they're doing okay. So it's easy to remember ABC if someone's a responsive patient and CAB, CAB if someone's unresponsive. So if pulse is present, the main thing we do, um, access the airways um, and follow normal ABC procedures. Um, Pat, what was the ABC? What does that stand for? A is for airway, B is for breathing, and C is for circulation. So it's for uh, if no pulse is found, we immediately begin chest compressions. Um, Open airway and ventilate patients. So you start with the CABs, what we just mentioned. Going with the airway. Um, so we got a, um, a patient that has a pulse and is responsive. If tongue or foreign object or fluid obstructs airway, air cannot travel freely. If it, a patient appears to talk, that means their air, uh, airway is probably doing just fine. Uh, patient is unresponsive, the airway may need to be open. Do the head, head tilt on the airway. Uh, the main thing after airway, uh, you can assess the breathing, uh, place ear near patient's nose uh, to listen to sounds. I do not do that. Um, I like to look at, um, a lot of times when it's someone that we are definitely worried about being um, unresponsive, whether we cut the shirt, we can at least see their belly to see if they're breathing. Um, that's, the, I think, the best thing, look at the mouth and chest to see if it's rising. And if they're not breathing, we have, um, we go ahead and give them O2 right away. Uh, this talks about the circulation of um, the blood. We have, we check for, I check for a carotid artery first um, to see if there's a pulse. Uh, you check for radial, you got your brachial, the femoral, and um, dorsal the pedis with the D. Um, I think carotid is the best. To check, I think it's the easiest to feel. Um, I might initially just go to the radial just because it's something that we you can do real quickly, and then if you can't, go straight to the carotid. Um, brachial, I don't do much of. Um, definitely don't do much of femoral. Radial takes stronger blood flow for a pulse uh, to be felt than the carotid. So if they have a radial pulse, um, their blood pressure will be a lot higher than if it's you can't, but then you can feel in the carotid. So if there's no pulse, which we'll get into, it's definitely straight to um, chest compressions. 
Uh, Corbin, what do ABCs that a patient assessment refer to? Thank you. All right, before starting CPR, we're going to take a little bit of a break, a um, 10 minute break. So, why? Uh, yeah. I know, we're going to take longer on this. Yeah, I get this. <laughs> this is probably better. Everyone's individually yeah. doing. <laughs> you have 44 minutes left on that battery. Thank you. But well, you want to take the break, so. Uh, it is really hard to do the exact same thing you just did. Oh, no. Like, what? Like, I'm not talking about that. No, no, that no, 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 no. You're, and you're well, way better. Better. And you're way better at just like BSing your way through a bunch of crap. Yanked it up, got to class on time. Nice. You felt like a beast. Yeah. You felt like this is great. Were you not calling it? 
Huh? Oh, I thought we were. Oh, I got you. Two more minutes. Oh, all right. Oh. So on uh, 
chest compression, the main component of the CPR, you force the heart to circulate blood through the body every time you pump it in, uh, or pump the chest. Patient survivability during cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest improves with early administration. If someone um, is a witnessed um, code, their chances of survival is a lot better in, compared to someone that they try to wake someone up and don't know how long they've been down. So, um, CPR, our chest compressions are performed different ways depending on patient's age and um, how big they are. Uh, cardiac arrest events are stressful. Um, since we are firefighters, we perform in the house, in the home, um, in public places. I've never had to do it outside of a residence. Um, has anyone else ever done CPR outside of a house or on the, I mean, a street, if a car wreck, I've done that before, but I've never done like at a shopping center or oh, yeah. anything. Aaron Dave, Aaron Dave saved somebody over 12s who's been in six months a year. Really? Yeah, they dropped it like Sam's when they were in 12s. Oh, wow. And uh, got him back before he was, uh, yeah, he was talking to him before they got in the ambulance. Like, wow. They, you know, okay. shock and everything. Like, yeah, I'd have never out. And I was like, all right, there's your career. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you guess what? That's true. That's like, possible. There's a witness of it. But a witness of it has helped. It does, yeah, it does help, yeah, like you said. Um, but I've, the mine have always been either from a car wreck or a sh I, I, mean, I guess I've done it side of the street with the, with the shooting. So um, they're always going to be stressful, whether the family's involved or friends involved, people yelling. There's a whole bunch of distractions that are going on. Um, if you're out in public, cops have done a, they do a pretty good job of creating a scene that um, helps you kind of focus on what you're doing. Um, but man, we, we do this all the time, so it's pretty easy. Just to stay focused on what you're doing. The relieve the look on a cop's face is always nice. Yeah. You come around the corner of the hotel room and they're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, because they don't like to do CPR very long. long man. Not and they also business. also do it on the bed, so they don't, yeah, I don't think they really like teach them. They're like, yeah. man, just get down yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Though it's easier for us, we have at least three of us to get the body on, on a hard surface um, compared to one cop. You don't want that head to bang on the floor 